Hey, it's Top Gnosis, and we're back with free keys of guest MR Osborne. Hello, Michael. Good to see you again. Yeah. I think I've closed off every show with you saying that uh, if you keep writing the books, we'll keep having you on. And so you keep writing the books, writing and translating. A lot of times people talk to us because they're selling a book. I only have people on the show whose books I like. So I always say, go buy the book, usually at the end of the show. I'm opening up with Go Buy the Book. This is my favorite of your books yet, Michael. It's eminently readable, but it's just packed with so much. It's one of those books that would be a great first-time introduction to Christian mysticism, Christian esoterica, the thought of Blake and Burma, Boehm, uh, however you want to say it. Uh, and it's also really great for like scholars, people who love Blake, and it's also great for people who are really immersed in this stuff. And Yaka Firma, who we're going to do a second show on, is notoriously difficult to read. His ideas are very complicated, and you broke them down in a wonderful way. But you've done an important piece of work by Blake, still a very popular scholarly interest. There's Blake Societies, there's Blake Studies, but you've made a lasting contribution really explaining his piece, the allegory for the spiritual condition of man. With all that said, go ahead and buy the book. The name of the book is The Alchemy of William Blake. The Three Principles of the Divine Essence in an Allegory of the Spiritual Condition of Man. Go to rosecirclebooks.com. You can pick it up there. There's going to be links. And we have the title for people who are watching at home, but the links are underneath. Okay, so Michael, I hope that I haven't embarrassed you. I haven't made you shine. No, no. I'm put too much on your shoulders to to live up to. Uh, because, uh... <laughs> you can say it's your favorite book by me for as long as you like. That's absolutely fine. It's my favorite book too, as it happens. So, yeah. so your book explores chemical symbolism in William Blake's work, as especially portrayed in one work. What is this work, and how did you make this connection to alchemy? The work is 1811 or around about that period is 1811 painting it's made with ink and a combination of paint and ink it's not particularly well preserved and the vibrancy that it would have had 100 years ago plus has been lost to some extent there you can purchase actually a reproduction of it um a hand painted reproduction they, they sell these with that vibrancy restored and it gives you a much better sense of what he was intending to do with the darkness and the light, which is an important theme, not only in this painting, but all of Blake's work. And it links in with Boehmer. This is a tempera, and Blake is, he intentionally, he usually painted with colour tinks on his lithographs. Now, in this instance, it's a painting, and it's pretty big. It's over four feet high, three feet wide. He was only known to have made three or four paintings of that size, whether or not it was commissioned, we simply don't know. It's not its original title, an allegory of the spiritual condition of man. Someone has given it that title. Um, I suspect someone who knew exactly what it was about gave it that title. But we know it wasn't Blake, so it appeared in the catalogue, its first catalogue, after his death uh, with, with that title. It's a pretty appropriate title. With regard to the connection with alchemy, you'll appreciate alchemy, like other great spiritual truths, is hidden in plain sight. Blake will produce something that engenders a sense of feeling in somebody um, as a beautiful work of art, but he will also invite you to look more deeply at the symmetry of the painting and the messages concealed in it. There is no doubt that it's connected with uh, philosophical alchemy, certainly. Uh, there were, there, for example, there were various themes I've mentioned it already uh, in the painting, such as um, darkness and light. But there are also other themes. There's a lot of numerical um, messages contained in the painting as well, because of its symmetry and what he's intending to do. That have cabalistic connections, for instance, um, and, and connections with other schools of thought. It's just. So you can see the contrasting structures in the painting. There are the three fates, the three virtues, the three luminaries at the bottom. You have a central figure, often regarded as the anima or the rising human soul, separating apart two. So you have that triadic form of man separating apart. Then you have the trinity of, of figures above. And above that is a circular figure representing the monad from which this light is emitted. 
and you can see this sort of structure as the light pours down these figures and yet the separate lights illuminating the central figure at the foot of the painting and the one in the middle too. Either side of, of this ninefold central image, there's nine central figures. Most of them are female. There's one androgyny at least. And we have a monad above. And either side of that are what are called the, the marginal images. These images represent 12 scenes from the Christian Bible. And they tell a story. The one on the left descends from darkness into increasing uh, light and the one on the right would start in darkness and ascend um, into ever increasing light on the right so that's the essential structure of the painting and then you also have the image of the earth or ground the one on the left um, has um, buildings and temples on it believed to represent the sort of old testament landscape and that on the right is a more idyllic uh, scene and there's a shepherd for instance um, sitting underneath the tree so it's almost like the old and the new Jerusalem at the foot of the painting. This whole book owes its genesis to my wife buying me tickets to the Blake exhibition at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. I wasn't expecting to encounter this painting. It was a very good exhibition. It has, it has a background to Blake and it talks about um, a lot of his other work. But then it moves into this gallery where you see this large painting because all the others are not big. Blake is trying to connect with the Renaissance. That is why he paints this way, to make the painting look older and connected with the Renaissance. It's intentional. It's lost a lot of its vibrancy because they can't restore it because it's drawn largely with ink. But, and on canvas as well, and on paper. But this painting is striking. And anyone that has an esoteric eye or some modicum of training in these things will simply stop and look at this painting for literally ages. I must have taken about a hundred photographs with my phone because you need to do that because these marginal images that you see in the columns of the painting, they are uniquely detailed and they're very important and tell a, 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 they give you the key. They're the, the key, if you like, to the cipher in the center of the painting. You would not move on from that, despite yeah. the fact that the curator, rather tellingly, puts um, a Boehmer, one of Boehmer's manuscripts, and some of the illustrations of Boehmer's manuscripts, directly next to this in the exhibition. A question that may be uh, obvious for the real heads. Lots of people still associate alchemy with turning lead into gold, right? You grab somebody off the street, you ask them, well, what's alchemy about? And they'll say some quackery where some crazy people tried to turn lead into gold. Could you tell us some philosophical alchemy and, and how this ties into Blake's overall oeuvre, his spiritual and philosophical thought? Sure, but I'd also add before I do that, that there's also a tradition in alchemy of, of trying to uh, create life too. And you'll be familiar with the homunculus and the homunculi as well. I do mention that in the book, some of Paracelsus' more weird explanations on how to achieve this, which also links in to some extent with Jewish magic in that part of the world. We're talking Central Europe, because Blake's influenced by Boehmer. Okay, but we'll come on to all of that, because I think that's more for the next meeting and Blake by the way if he's anything would be a philosophical alchemist he may not have identified in in those terms but he's influenced by it philosophical alchemy owes its origins to a large extent to Boehmer the process is already beginning with Paracelsus who's trying to make alchemy more acceptable and saying this can be a, a Christian process uh, to establish and prove the existence of spirit in a, in a quasi-scientific context. This was pre-science, but it's like the science of the time. Okay? Now, like Blake was a visionary, indeed Swedenborg as well, and others, some Latin and so on, they have visions of the realms, of the worlds. For Boehmer, he uses alchemical symbology, terminology, and symbolism to explain how God is, 
how the world is and what man's role in the world is too. He finds in Paracelsus, he's a self-taught man, he has a mentor, a couple of mentors who introduce him to these things, but he's self-taught, he has these visions. So like Blake, there is an independent source of gnosis involved, a little like St. Paul, who is trying to explain to the apostles who knew Christ in the flesh. He's saying, look, my authority comes from Christ, but in a different way, because he directly approached me with this act of gnosis, this enlightenment that I had on the Damascus Road. Boomer is similar. And like Paul, he's tapping into this existing tradition and terminology, but applying it in a way that he feels is perhaps more accurate and true to the actual message itself. So there you have it. In alchemy, there are traditionally four stages. It was reduced to three quite often in the late 16th, early 17th century to identify it with the Trinity. But the fourth was always concealed within because it's truly quaternary and expressed as a Trinity. There's a great profundity in the message in that, which is more complex for this conversation, but we can come on to that, hopefully. Traditionally, the stages would be, for instance, um, the first step is, would be calcination, associated with purification. That's the actual substance itself that is taken by the alchemist and processed. There's dissolution, stirring the pot that this product is in. There would be separation, so separating the material or substance that you're looking for from the original substance. We would have conjunction, considered the point of no return, where these two substances are permanently separated. Uh, there'll be fermentation, that period of growth, um, which in Christian alchemy would be identified with, for instance, death and resurrection. And then you'd have distillation, the, the refined stage. Now, Traditionally, practical alchemy that may be achieving, as you say, lead from gold, but that's really a euphemism for, if you like, the attempt to transform a base material into its correct spiritual form. And Boehm is using this terminology. Now, for young, there's 12 stages of alchemy. And these were defined at some point in the late 16th, early 17th century. But they're all, they all come down essentially to the four core principles that were there at the, um, originally. In Blake's painting, you can see these 12 stages. And they also connect with astrological principles, with the 12 astrological stages. We can draw parallels here with the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles and so on. There's a cosmological story behind the biblical story, the story of alchemy and what Boehm is trying to establish. And he in turn influences Swedenborg, influences the likes of Blake and Pasquale and, um, and San Martin and so on and so forth. So there is this um, origin, if you like, in the terminology that is used by alchemy. And that's the difference, I think, because in practical alchemy, you have the likes of Paracelsus trying to prove scientifically the existence of spirit in the laboratory. One of those things might be, for instance, the attempt to create a human being out of uh, the material things. And there are examples of homunculi and, and all the rest of it. And I, as I said earlier, it mirrors what um, Jewish magic were doing. It was the creation of golems, for instance. There is a connection. There is a underlying theme going on. But Boehmer doesn't want this. He is uh, interested in the spiritual transformation. And in order to understand that, you have to understand the nature of God. That's what he's coming from. We're, we're definitely going to uh, dive into that, partly in this show, but as we've been promising, there will be a sequel that will dive into Boehm's thought. Coming back to Blake, the book touches on Blake's political views and their connection to his spiritual beliefs. Sure. How do you see Blake's mysticism influencing his stance on social and political issues of his time? For Blake, the imagination is king. And he saw 
dogma and law and constraints upon individual expression as a generally bad thing. And the events in entire mythology, like Eurus and the demigod, it was the demiurge of Gnosticism appearing as an old man with Masonic compasses. He develops a whole mysticism around that. He does this because if he is too critical of authority, church authority, political authority, he's going to get in trouble, particularly in this age of enlightenment where there are revolutions first taking place in the United States against perceived political tyranny and also then again in France. Now, Blake, of course, would have been deeply saddened by the outcome of the revolution in France or the reign of terror, but he was very much in favour of the principles of the French Revolution of equality. And these are the equality is very important to him. He's, he is almost like a prototype early feminist in some respects because he believes in the equality of men and women, but he's also a man of his time in as much as, if you like, gender-specific roles might be envisaged. But, and you can't blame him, he's an 18th century man, but he does believe quite firmly in equality and he's also extremely anti-slavery. And the commerce triangulaire is at its height during his lifetime, the, sl the African slave trade, and Blake is very much opposed to this. And he's opposed to dogma, he's opposed to restrictive laws, he's a Republican living in England during the time of these revolutions in America and France. He does get in trouble with the authorities at some point, but he manages to talk his way out of it. Essentially, he's treated as a bit of a madman by the authorities. Bit of a nut job. So they leave him alone, like all mystics that keep their head below the parapet. They're left alone in history. It's only the ones that make a song and dance that get noticed. So he develops this symbolism, This he invents his own mythology in order to communicate these ideas that he thinks will play a part in changing society. He believes that his work will do that. He believes in the power of art. He thinks if you will look at his work and understand it and take the time to appreciate and make it work on you and your soul, that it will change the way you view yourself, God and society, if that helps. That's amazing. So you did mention Blake and Swedenborg, Swedenborg. Blake and Swedenborg, you've mentioned them already. You draw connections between Blake's work and various esoteric traditions in the book. But besides Swedenborg, do you think Blake was consciously drawing from from these sources, from esoteric traditions, from other thinkers? Or is he arriving at similar conclusions independently? And for the sources that you think that he did, he combine these different influences into his unique vision, if I'm making sense? Did he transform them? Did he mutate any of these influences? Or is he following in the tradition and expressing that? Okay. If that question makes sense. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I've long said, there is no such thing as a truly original thought. And the reason for that is, thoughts, like people, are born, and they have to have a parent. Now, uh, the parents of our thoughts are other thoughts, and we are influenced by other people. For, in, for example, you're wearing a dog collar. Now, that's a cultural, specific cultural symbol that you're using as a symbol of your ministry and ordination. But you didn't dream that up. That's come to you from somebody else. It's come from somebody else from them. And its symbol is ultimately that of a collar of, if you like, slavery, of being owned, slavery in a good way, of being owned by your church, by the ecclesia. Now, this isn't the church in the sense of a sort of bunch of stuffy old men. It's the sense of the ecclesia uh, and the communion uh, to which you are in service. So that's an example. So... Blake was a religious seeker, and he believed that energy, so this is the sort of the energy of the imagination, if you will, is often called, in, in, in some respects, evil by certain religious people. And they would see new thoughts, new ideas, as potentially evil. 
Now, all of these original thinkers, like Paracelsus or Boehmer or, or Swedenborg and, and Blake and Pasquale and so on, they're not truly original thinkers because they're building on this, if you like, knowledge or gnosis of earlier people but they are nonetheless original in the sense that they do something new they build on that which would be regarded perhaps as immoral or evil by people who are trapped in this dogmatic approach okay you had the confines of dogma it's given to you by authority alone now blake would have rejected that because whilst he would say that tradition is important you also have to have reason and you also have to have other things such as scripture and in his instance, also direct revelation as a, a pillar, if you like, these four pillars for his way of thinking. So, yes, he was influenced by Boehmer. We know that he owned his books. We know he was influenced by Swedenborg because he attended the new church in London. OK, we know he was influenced by the great artists of the Renaissance and all their platonic views that, that came to him. Okay, they were influenced by so and the Greek, the Greek Plato, Plato. All of these things are there, but he also has this other thing, which is this direct revelation. All his life, he had communications and conversations with his deceased brother Robert, for instance, who taught him a certain process of of printing and of preserving, of colouring his works. And Blake would he he had he described like Swedenborg that he had visions of heaven and hell and things like this. So his particular views, he reacted and, and rejected the traditional views of good and evil um, and wanted to reinterpret them um, in a way that he would see as authentic and helpful to other people. So yes, influenced, because there's no such thing as a truly original idea. But his ideas were coming from other people and from himself and from a direct interaction with spiritual energies beyond. This is Blake's view. Um, this is why his art is produced the way it is. So your book discusses the idea of spiritual evolution in Blake's work. Uh, how does this concept manifest in his art and writing, and how does it differ from the more conventional religious views of his time? Okay, here we go. Cut the painting. Now, you can't see them very clearly. And this is why anyone listening to this podcast is going to have to um, just download an image of the of the painting. And you're going to we'll make sure to put a link in. You can see these marginal scenes. So let's take the top left hand corner, Jonathan. Okay. It's hard to see, but you have an image of what appears to be an archangel, if you like, winged and, and flying through the air. Now, that's either the original human spirit, Adam Cadmon, or it's Lucifer. Now, I like to think it's Lucifer because of Blake's cosmology. Essentially, the devil is cast out of heaven, falls on earth. He can't influence or try and uh, rebel against God. So what he does is he turns his attention to Adam and Eve. And they're the next people down, and it's hard to see, but you've got a male and female figure standing there holding a bunch of clothes. And in front of them is is what appears to be um, a super angel talking to them. Now, the clothes, they're naked, and the clothes represent their um, nakedness. Now, the origins of the story of the nakedness of Adam and Eve and their shame when God comes into the Garden of Eden and after the partaking of the apple of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that their nakedness is their spiritual purity, or virginity, as Blake would put it, and Boehmer, for that matter. And clothes represent the materiality they're taking on. So this is the fall. Beneath that, you have an ark. It's Noah's ark, by the way. There's a rainbow underneath that. And then there's a scene of the Tower of Babel, and you have Ogdenus, Abraham, and Isaac, either side. Now, all these three eras are quite prolonged, but Noah is alive during all of them. Noah's alive, obviously, during the period of the deluge, the flood, and he's also alive when Abraham plays a role in the destruction of the 
Tower of Babel. And Isaac is the primary founder of the of the uh, people of Israel, Hebrews. Now, beneath that, you have an image of Pharaoh, and in front of him is a woman holding a baby up, probably holding Moses. So this is a period of captivity. Okay, it's the captivity in Egypt. Now, quite aside from what I've mentioned so far, you'll pick up these ideas of water or things like that. Beneath that, a scene of um, King David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba is heavily pregnant. She's carrying King Solomon, and the, and the future uh, temple that Solomon will build is in the background. Some people think that's King Solomon. I, I believe quite strongly that it's David and Bathsheba. David, of course, um, is responsible for bringing a plague upon Israel and the whole story of, of the uh, seduction of Bathsheba and the, and the way that Bathsheba's husband is essentially murdered on a suicide mission by David is quite telling. So you have this descent, this, if you like, devolution, to go back to your question, in this biblical narrative. And it's very left path stuff, isn't it? And it literally is on the painting. And at the very bottom, in this cloud shaped like a crescent or moon, because this side of the painting represents the logical lunar side of things, or the influence of the moon upon six particular astrological signs, so the negative watery aspects of things, you have the cross. And it's typical of Blake, you have the cross um, from behind. So you always, with Blake, approach things from Christ's actual perspective. And, of course, there's the crowd, the usual crowd of tormentors. And there will also be, and there is in this, the, uh, the three Marys that stay loyal to him. And they tie in with the three women that you see at the bottom of the painting as well. Now, when you move to the right-hand column, there's another six figures, and they ascend, and you have spiritual evolution. And this is the alchemical process of change from the elemental earth from which Adam and Eve originally fell. They descend, devolve, and then you can begin to see the transformation of the physical materiality from the resurrection here. It's the empty tomb. You've got three Marys approaching the empty tomb all the way up to the kingdom of heaven right at the top after the resurrection of the dead. So the sequence is empty tomb, you have Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles, you have St. Peter in prison, so that's the whole um, sense of awareness of our in incarceration and also escape, because of course the story of Peter in prison is that the Holy Spirit opens the door and allows him to escape to continue his ministry, but Peter continues to suffer as we know. And above that, you have the the Beast of Revelation. I talk about this in my book. There are strong parallels. And above that, you have the trumpets of the last resurrection, the general resurrection of the dead and the kingdom of heaven above. So this story of return, and it's the sun that dominates this margin of the painting. And they also represent the six, six other astrological signs under the influence of the sun. So, your book touches on Blake's views of good and evil, but how does his understanding of these concepts differ from traditional Christian theology and the theology of his times? I've already touched on it, because he his views, if he'd have written them directly, would have gotten him in massive trouble, because for Blake, desire and energy are essentially um, inherently good or evil. They can be both. And it ties in with Boehmer. We won't go into too much detail on Boema, but Boema wants to. Boema's very interested, and as we all are, in explaining why the world is as it, as it is. And in order to do that, you've got to understand God, you've got to understand the origins of good. And evil is something that is inherently um, present, it's something that is absolutely necessary for life to exist. It is. The cause of fear, which is the root of all anxiety and things of that nature. But it also gives the impetus as well for the forces of procreation and creativity and things of that nature. Now, 
fear, if it's transformed, like negative sex energy, for instance, if it's transformed, can be something that is actually converted to something that is good and useful and beneficial. It depends who's using it and how. Okay, so good in one sense for Blake is the, if you like, the sense in which we obey reason, we obey our thoughts, it's head over heart. Whereas for him, evil, and the word is not helpful and for either Blake or Boehmer, but we have to use words, as Boehmer, as Boehmer says, to explain these things. Evil would be the, the active energy that you need. So you, in all things, there's this passive and active. There's the male and female, the positive and the negative, the sun and the moon. And this, of course, manifests itself in physical creation. Evil, God, there is no evil in God, but the potentiality of evil is in God. So it manifests itself through that original rebellion, as I say, that I was talking about on that left margin with Lucifer being cast from heaven. And that's when it comes about. And so for Blake, religion is a battle. And that's the best way of describing it between those two opposing aspects, which is reason, the head, and active energy or passion or the heart. And if you have an imbalance, if you have only evil, the absence of good, suffering results. But if you have only good, then there's an absence of free will, there's an absence of imagination, there's an absence of life and generation that, that comes from it. And I touch upon these themes, of course, in The Brazen Serpent, which you've read. And we had a couple of talks about that too. Because there is this divine code concealed in nature, which points to, it's like what I was saying at the very beginning, these great traditions, if they're any really good for us, are always hidden in plain sight. And so I think the idea of evil, yes, yeah, so you could see why, for instance, with people who might believe, and many do, in, in a personified evil, as, as Blake's views is extremely heretical and perhaps even dangerous. Okay. But there's extremes on both sides. If you had a society that was absolutely too good, you'd end up with something really that would be unbearable for most of us as well. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about his ideas about imagination in relation to culture, to the world lived in, the world that he wanted to see. But how do you think Blake's ideas about imagination and creativity relate to his more spiritual, philosophical beliefs? What, what does the imagination, its, its role play in, in religion? Christ is the imagination. But for Blake, we are also Christ. Because every aspect of his also ours. Now, you would be thinking he must be a Gnostic. He is with a small G, isn't he? But he's not with a big G. Because Blake isn't a joiner. He remains an Anglican for the rest of his life. And this always takes me back to this idea, and I've long held it, that you need grounding in things. So you have to have, yeah, you do. You have to have the exoteric with the esoteric. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to have the Catholic doctrine. And although Blake, he spends his life um, rejecting authority and favouring reason over, sorry, favouring energy over reason and preferring Milton's devil to God in, in, in Paradise Lost, he doesn't, there's a sense in him which acknowledges ultimately through his conduct that, he is always very ultimately loyal to the exoteric side of things as a means of grounding him because this is a bloke who already flew off on a tangent whose mind and creativity was so powerful and energetic that without that 
he really probably truly would have been mad rather than pretending to be in order to protect himself from the political authorities. Now, he was married in Anglican Church, he was christened an Anglican, and he died and was buried um, an Anglican. He never changed any of that. He didn't join the new church. He went along to it. He was not a joiner. He was a unique voice, unique thought. Okay. So talking about being a unique voice, a unique thought, how, how do you think Blake's unconventional views on religion, spirituality, culture, influenced his reception during his lifetime, but also later? He wasn't well received during his lifetime. He had patrons, they helped him, but he, he was poor. He was, if you like, quote unquote, self-published. He wouldn't have wanted to have been beholden to a patron. He'd have preferred poverty over the lack of independence though and while he struggled he was somehow he was provided for and he did have one or two generous sponsors that whilst they couldn't keep him out of a difficult life he'd managed to survive and produce his art and by way of example he had a, an exhibition around the belt of uh, one of his um, brother's um, print shops I think and old carpenters shops and it was a flop because the establishment had turned against him it upset people it prickled their feelings they were like we're not going to sell your paintings or today we're going to publish you so it's that kind of thing and Blake was like whatever because I'm going to carry on anyway so the establishment rejected him during his lifetime except for some enlightened souls um, and he only comes into his own, like most great artists, um, after his death. And people go, wow, this guy really did produce some beautiful things. And his work is incomparably beautiful. Yes. Yeah. And, and incredibly unique, as, as you were talking about. We can see his influences if you're looking more at the visual influences, the poetic influences. But at the same time, he is almost a man at a time. It's it's incredibly uh, singular, unique, powerful. Yeah. Thing. Well, we can't yeah, really uh, live in of our time, really. But there are occasionally people who do come out and think outside the box, and he's one of them, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think this just about wraps up part one, folks. Come back, part two. The name of the book, again, is The Alchemy of William Blake, The Three Principles of the Divine Essence, Allegory, and the Spiritual Condition of Men. Of man, go to rosecirclebooks.com, buy your copy, and if you want to help us, keep the show going. It's patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can do micropayments through there every month. You sign up for a subscription, but you can do paypal.me slash Gnostic for one-time donations. Any little bit helps, and if you're unable to help us out financially, share the show, subscribe, rate it, all that stuff helps uh, more people to see it, and just tell people about the show. Take this episode, it's your new favorite episode, send it to somebody who would love it. That would be, uh... so Michael, we we will uh, see you again soon for part two, but thanks so much for writing this book. Thanks for joining. Bye, Wilma. Thank you.